All right, John chapter 5, I'm starting in verse 1. Jesus went up to Jerusalem for one of the Jewish festivals. We don't know which one it was, but one of the Jewish festivals. And now there is in Jerusalem near the Sheep Gate a pool, which in Aramaic is called Bethesda, and which is surrounded by five covered colonnades. So a pretty ornate pool there on the eastern wall side of the city of Jerusalem. Verse 3, here, a great number of disabled people used to lie, including the blind, the lame, and the paralyzed. Now, if you just pause there for just a moment, of course, what you're left wondering is, why did all of these people gather at this pool on that eastern wall in Jerusalem? Uh, It appears that many people who read this account in John's Gospel wondered, what was the deal with all of these people gathering at the pool? And so at some point, you might have noticed this in your Bible as you read ahead of time, that there's a little note that said, some manuscripts don't include the next verse, verse 4. Someone probably inserted it in there to help explain why the people gathered at the pool. So I find it helpful, so I'm going to include that verse, okay? So the very next verse says, after verse 3, here a great number of disabled people used to lie by this pool, and here's why. They were all waiting for the moving of the waters. You see, from time to time, it was rumored that an angel of the Lord would come down and that he would stir up the waters in that pool, and that when that happened, the first one into the pool, after each such disturbance, would be cured of whatever disease they had. So it was seen as a miraculous pool. All right. Well, one who was there had been an invalid for 38 years. And when Jesus saw him lying there by the pool, and he learned that he had been in this condition for a long time, Jesus asked, Do you want to get well? Sir, the invalid replied, I have no one to help me into the pool when the water is stirred. And and, and then while I'm trying to get, someone else goes down ahead of me. And then Jesus said to him, get up. Pick up your mat and walk. And at once the man was cured. He picked up his mat and he walked. That's the first nine verses of John chapter 5. You have this man who has been an invalid for 38 years. That means for 38 years he has been partially, if not completely, paralyzed. The text doesn't tell us if that's because of some accident, if he was born this way, if it's due to some kind of really grave sickness that's rendered him so weak that he can't move an inch. But it says very clearly in the text, for 38 years he's been an invalid. Now, I think this probably goes without saying, but I'm going to go ahead and say it this morning. Uh, I think that means that for 38 years, you have a man here who longed to walk again. A man who for 38 years longed to be able to run with vibrancy in life. You have a man who clearly for 38 years longed to be well, right? And what happens when I read this text and I kind of let... um, Uh, my imagination ran a little bit to imagine what life must have been like for him. I I think it's pretty clear probably that throughout the earliest years of his 38 years of being an invalid, that in that longing he started to seek answers. Is there any way that I could be able to walk or to run to just be well? I can imagine that back in those times for someone like him, that he would have people carry him over to doctor after doctor after doctor, just seeing, is there any way that I can be well? Do you have any insight, anything that I can do. Who knows if maybe this man even went outside of the traditional medical field and sought what we would sometimes call nothing more than witch doctors. Maybe this guy's had some pretty crazy concoctions given him that maybe that would help him walk or maybe it would help him run. Who knows how many exercises have been assigned to him that maybe one day he could walk, one day he could run, one day he could be well. But I could imagine through a number of years in his 38 years, he's tried whatever he has been able to try in all of his long, and yet it kept coming up short, and yet he had loved ones, I'm sure, that were keeping an eye out for maybe the latest medical advancement or the latest rumor of something miraculous that could happen for him because they knew his longing. And so what I can imagine is you've got this guy who's been an invalid for 38 years, and, and one day he's in his home there in Jerusalem. He's lying on his mat on the floor, and he's just maybe staring at the back wall, the sun's going down, he's watching the shadows dance, he's thinking, his eyes are 
stung with tears because he just longs to be well. And then he hears the shuffling of feet. Someone comes in to visit him that afternoon. And they come in and they don't show themselves. They're kind of holding back a little bit. And they say this very quietly and very sheepishly. And they tell him, I don't, I don't know if you've heard about this. If you have, you can stop me. But there's this rumor that over on the east side, over by that eastern wall, over by the sheep gate, there's a pool. You know that pool that they build? It's so ornate and beautiful. There's a rumor that, you know, there was a guy or a gal. I don't know exactly who it was, but the, when the water started to, to bubble, that wasn't just because of the water rushing in to help refill that pool from, from some of those currents that had been created and dug out, but that that's something miraculous, that, that they say an angel of the Lord actually comes down and stirs the water, and if you're the first one in, that you're going to be healed. And look, I don't know. I know you've been to doctor after doctor. You've tried so many different things, but maybe, maybe, And so it seems from this text that that guy sat there and thought to himself, oh, why not? I've tried every doctor. I've tried every concoction. I've tried every exercise. Why not try this pool? And so off he had himself carried and and laid next to that pool. And the text indicates that it seems that for a long period of time, maybe every single day, he had someone carry him to that pool. Maybe they were a friend on the way to work, and they would drop him off and lay him by the pool, and they would say and whisper a prayer together, maybe today's going to be the day. And so this guy, for I don't know, maybe it was the full 38 years, this is his to-do list every single day of his life to stay there by the pool and watch the waters, stay by the pool Watch the waters. Watch for the movement. Maybe the miraculous. Watch for the movement of waters. Maybe the miraculous. And yet again and again and again, nothing. As he indicates to Jesus, someone always beats him down into that water and he can't get in there. And yet every day he's waiting by the pool. And I like to imagine one day he's by the pool like that day in his house. And he's laying there on his mat, and the day is growing long. Maybe the shadows and sun are dancing on the water, and he's just watching it and waiting, watching it and waiting. And there's a voice behind him that probably didn't sound very sheepish, but pretty authoritative. And he asks the question of this invalid man, do you want to get well? Now, I don't know if you read that this week or when I just read that, you think to yourself, what kind of question is that? Do you want to get well? For 38 years, this guy has been an invalid. Do you want to get well? It sounds kind of cold, doesn't it? Like if I had a sinus infection for just one day, and you came up to me and said, oh, I see that you have a sinus infection. Do you want to get well? The likelihood of me wanting to slap you upside the head runs really high. No, I want this to go for days on end. Do you want to get well, the voice says. It sounds cold but it's kind. It really is. Because it's just another way for Jesus to be able to say to this man, I can make you well. I can make you well. It's not cold, it's kind. And at the same time, you need to be really clear, kind doesn't necessarily mean that it's not confrontational. I don't think Jesus is asking this question because he actually doesn't know the answer to it. He knows the answer to it. There has to be some reason. He asks this man, hey, do you want to get well? And it's a kindness. Jesus is saying, I can make you well. But it's also confrontational because remember, it's likely that for years this guy has believed that his eyes have to be locked on faithfully every single day. This pool, these waters... That he thinks is he's got any chance to be made well, it's going to be this pool. And what Jesus does when he comes up behind this man is his eyes are locked in the waters and Jesus says, do you want to get well? It's this kind but confrontational way of Jesus asking that question to say, take your eyes off the pool and put them on me. Is Jesus saying as lovingly as he can? For years, this pool, despite all of its water, has come up empty for you. Do you want to get well? 
then turn to me, eyes on me, look at me, ears on me, listen to me, come to me. If need be, have someone carry you to me, come to me. It's an amazing moment. It's a really tough moment for this guy too, isn't it? Year after year after year, he's been told, this is your best chance at getting well. And this voice behind him that sets himself up against, Jesus pits himself against this pool and says, you've got a decision to make. Do you want to get well because I'm here now? It's Jesus, as odd as it sounds, setting himself up as the greater pool, right? The greater cleansing, the greater opportunity to healing. And you know the rest of the story. Is that the man turns to Jesus, and even in the moment, you can see how committed he is to that pool. He says, oh yeah, I absolutely want to get well, but the problem is, is that you know, I don't have anyone to carry me down to the waters, and even when that happens, all the people, they trounce over me, and I can't get in there. But Jesus silences him in that moment and says, no, no, get up and walk. So as the man does just that, it's, it's this, this amazing image. Here's a guy who, I mean, for the first time in 38 years, The waters are still, but the word of Jesus echoes out, and the man stands and he walks. He's well. He's well. It's a beautiful story, isn't it? Absolutely beautiful story. It's also one of those stories that sometimes, because it's a miracle story, I just want to kind of rush right past it. Because one of the things I wrestle with is the same thing that you wrestle with is that, you know, I sit there and I think to myself, man, miracles are really very rare. And so sometimes I rush past this because I say what this showed, it displayed the power of who Jesus is. Let's, let's move right along to some of the, 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 the meat of the teachings and the applicable kind of stuff because that's a miracle and miracles are rare. And the truth is, I've told you this before, I do think miracles are very rare. I do. I think miracles are a lot more rare in Scripture than we even realize. Not happening on an every other page reunion. They're pretty rare. God uses some of these acts of power pretty sparingly. And so sometimes I could be tempted. In fact, originally, originally, this was not a passage I was going to preach on until once again I shared this with you a few weeks ago. That one of the great challenges that John gives me is the same challenge he gives you. Remember what I said a few weeks ago when we talked about that wedding in Cana. John actually chooses not to use the language of miracles. He uses the language of signs. Because what John is saying is, yeah, absolutely pay attention to the act of power that God has done here. He has bent and even broken the rules of nature. But this is a sign more than it's an act of power. This is something that points to you some truth about Jesus and your relationship with him, which means this is bigger than just the miraculous, that this is something that is applicable to you and to me, even above and beyond the miraculous. This is a sign. It's a sign. And so I stretch myself and I push myself. And what I realize, of course, is what this tells me about Jesus is a really very simple thing, is that Jesus is the only one who's going to make me well. It doesn't matter what it is. It confronts the fact that whenever I find myself unwell at any point in my life, I'm not just talking physically, any unwellness in my life, that it frustrates me to no end how prone I am to chase after pools and not Jesus. Every time that I come to this text, every time that I come to this text, I am unwell in some way. And so are you. Now, could it be physical? Maybe. Maybe it is. But I know it goes much more beyond that. Again, remember, John is asking us to think bigger. This is a sign. This tells us something bigger about us. We all come to this text unwell in some way, shape, or form. It doesn't matter if we're wrestling with some deep-seated anger or hatred, if it's a fractured relationship, if it's some stubborn sin that we can't get rid of. We come to this text. We come to really any of these miracle texts, and we are unwell. And one of the things I realized about myself is sometimes I will sit there in my life 
And I will keep going back to the same things that I hope will bring me breakthroughs. Man, I'm unwell. I don't know what to do with this. I don't know how to fix this fracture, to put it back into place. And so you know what? I think what I need to do is I need to talk to my wife about it. Or some of you will say, I need to talk to my husband about it. Or I need to talk to my best friend because they have such wisdom. I need to call up that person. You know what? I just need to get a book on this. I need to figure this out because there's people far smarter than me. And so we read bestsellers or we fire up articles and we fire up the Kindle and we read some book or we call someone or we send in email because we think to ourselves I've got to figure this out I've got to, I've got to be well and what we don't realize is there are all of these pools that we can go to and in the midst of that it's funny because we go to these things and we realize man there's some good in this but I feel like there's something more even if it's not necessarily comfortable That this kind of sometimes has the makings of sounding authoritative, but it's empty. That's what I mean, like these pools, they've got a lot of water and it feels kind of refreshing, but ultimately there's something about it that's still missing. And in that moment when your eyes are stung with tears, you hear this voice. It's in this text where Jesus says, do you want to get well? And there's this moment for us, even though we've maybe been Christians all our lives, where we think, oh, that's right, Jesus. I wonder if he has something to say about this. It's like a Bible college professor that I had, and I I laughed. He said, man, there's so many times that I get called into churches where they're in the midst of all of this conflict, or there's been some moral failure, and they don't know how to handle it. He says, we'll be sitting around a table, and I'll ask them, "What what have you been doing? What have you been led to do? And he says, these people, they'll just say, well, we've thought about this, but we don't know, and we've thought about this, and we've thought about this. And he says, at some point, someone says, you know, I think maybe we should just pray. And he says this idea of just pray as if, you know, well, I guess maybe we should just, maybe we should turn to God. You think? And he says this is as dumb as a nation who's being overrun by some evil nation and they're about to get trampled over militaristically and all of a sudden they realize, well, maybe we should just use that nuclear weapon. You think? Well, I've gone over here and I've gone over there and there's some wisdom and that seems really smart. Oh yeah, Jesus. Maybe I should ask Jesus. These are pools. Reunion. We carry ourselves or we have others carry us to these pools and we're laid by down them and and we're the same way. We're We're waiting for the waters to move and we think, okay, maybe this is it. Maybe this will help me. And this piercing voice that's also so loving because he's saying, I want to make you well. Do you want to get well? It's this moment where I'm constantly realizing, and and, man, there's some good things some good people I can reach out to that can offer me wisdom, but here's the bottom line. I'm sorry. Truth of the matter is, you go to Jesus first. It's that simple. Put down the phone. Fire down the Kindle. Shut the book. Stop reading the article. I don't care what your favorite blogger has to say. Do you want to get well? Jesus. And I know that you can sit back and say, but those those other things are good things. I'm not saying they're not good things. You say, well, are those good supplemental things to have, you know, so I can go and talk to Jesus, but I'd still like to hear what my mom has to say about it. Hey, look, I'm tempted to tell you that's totally fine, but you know what's really weird to me? The text doesn't let me this morning, sorry. Sorry. Maybe that'll be for another sermon. But isn't it fascinating that Jesus looks at that guy and basically tells him, pool's closed from here on. You ain't going back. Because what does he say to him? Pick up the mat and go. Pretty powerful thing because in those ancient cultures, a mat was basically a statement of, this is who I am for the rest of my life, and this is what I will lay down here, and I will lay upon it. This is, this is my life. And Jesus says, no, you roll that thing up and go. You don't need to be here anymore. It is the equivalent of Jesus hanging up a sign that says, pool's closed. It's done.
These are the questions that I find myself asking on the other side of this text. When I'm not well in my life, this is a tough question because I know the answers a lot of times. When I'm not well in life, is my first inclination to head to some pool that despite all of its water has often proven empty to me? I deal with this all the time in ministry. You know, everyone's sitting here going, man, what are we going to do about human sexuality? And it's very easy for someone to say, you know who you should read on this. And in that moment, Jesus is saying, hey, I got a few things I want to talk about. Will I choose to seek Jesus first in the midst of life's ills? Like, actually, what are some of the pools that maybe ought to be closed, if at least for a bit? in your life. It's just something kind of unexpected that's happening to me in sex. There's probably some people I ought to stop reading for a while, honestly. Because there's moments sometimes where I'm sitting there going, man, I don't feel like that jives with Jesus. I should probably say, hey, kind of enough of you for a while. I should probably spend some time with Jesus. These are tough questions, Reunion, but they're important ones. Because all of those are riffing off whether or not you really want to know the answer to this question, which is, do you want to get well? Do you want to get well? And whatever flies through your head on what's going on right now that seems unwell, do you want to get well? You have choices to make. First moves to make. Do you want to get well? But it gets this too, and I'm not going to ignore this. I'm not going to ignore this, and I'll tell you why in a moment. But it also gets into not just do you want to get well, but also the rest of the story is do you want to get saved? Because it's interesting what happens with this guy is that it sure indicates, at least by the actions of Jesus, that this guy could very well be well, but he's not saved. Look at, look at how the rest of this story goes. And the day on which this healing took place was a Sabbath. And so the Jewish leaders, they said to this man who'd been healed, it's the Sabbath. The law forbids you to carry your mat. Isn't this great? You love these religious leaders. This guy's just been healed and he's running with his mat because he's so excited. He said, you're breaking the Sabbath. You're not supposed to carry a mat. You're not supposed to do any work. And the man who was healed replied because I think he's panicking. Oh, the man who made me well said to me to pick up, pick up my mat and to walk. All the Jewish leaders asked the man, well, who is this fellow who told you to pick it up and walk? It says the man who was healed had no idea who it was, for Jesus had slipped away into the crowd that was there. I, you know, I think more than anything in these few verses with this poor man is really just that. I think to myself, this poor man. I mean, he's sitting on top of the world. He has just been healed physically, and immediately he runs smack dab into these religious leaders who tell him, ah, you look like you're well physically, but are you okay spiritually? And they bring up the law of the Sabbath, which puts him in a panic. Because basically what he's trying to do there, I think, is he's trying to throw Jesus under the bus. He's trying to find a loophole. Well, this guy who healed me told me to do this, and I thought he probably has some kind of authority, so I thought it was okay. And really, if you want me to, I can try and track him down. I wish I had his name, and I would hand him over to you. Because immediately he starts to panic, because what happens is he realizes they're right. This is amazing. I just got the use of my legs back, and what's the first thing I did? I walked myself into violating the law. He's just gotten his legs back and he's weak at the knees because he realizes, man, I'm still just a mess. They're right. I wasn't just physically unwell before. I was spiritually unwell and I'm still spiritually unwell because what's going to happen is the thing that has happened all my life. I'm going to break these laws from time to time. The guy just goes into a pure panic because of what these religious leaders bring his way. I don't agree with the things somewhat that the religious leaders raise, but they are actually raising an important point. Is it possible to be well, but still be unwell? So this man goes into a panic because he realizes I am anything but holy, and he goes into a panic because he thinks to himself, you know what, I'm still spiritually crippled. There's nothing that I can do except the things that I've been taught to do, which is I got to do something. And so I find this really fascinating. This is the very next verse. This is where Jesus then eventually finds this guy. Look at this. And later, Jesus found this man at the temple. And it's really easy to skip over that, but I think it's really important for you to see that. Because this guy is in such a panic over his spiritual state, his spiritual crisis, that he does what every good Jew is supposed to do when they realize they've sinned. I've got to get myself out of this mess, and so on to the temple he goes. 
Because if I just pray this prayer, if I just offer this confession, if I fast in this way, if I go to the temple and I offer up this kind of sin sacrifice, if I call on the priest to do this for me, if I can just do these things, everything is going to be okay. And yet he's just like you and me. He realizes everything is not okay because I'm probably just going to mess up again tomorrow. But doggone it, he has carried himself to that temple. And he is there doing whatever he can. And make no mistake about it, reunion, this is the beautiful thing about the imagery that John does. He's a lot more subtle about it, but that temple is just another pool, isn't it? Offering prayers, fasting fasts, offering sacrifices, hoping there's something in that and the waters of those pools that get stirred that finally that'll tip the hand of God toward just saying, okay, you're good now. And so he's probably offering his sacrifice at the temple and his eyes are stung with tears. And then what happens? There's a voice behind him which says, do you want to get well? I know that's not exactly what Jesus says, but I think that's what he's saying. Actually, what happens is later Jesus found this man at the temple and he said to him, see, you are well again, but stop sinning or something worse may very well happen to you. And what Jesus is referencing, I think, in the midst of all of that when he says stop sinning, he's not saying, okay, if you can just stop sinning, then you're going to be okay. Because that doesn't jive with everything else Jesus says, does it? Because it's not about the things we do or do not do. It's about the things that he has done for us. And so what Jesus is saying when he says stop sinning is he's referencing that he already knows what this guy has been doing, which is he's trying to distance himself from Jesus. You heard that with the religious leaders. They come to him, they confront him about the Sabbath, and he says, well, it was that guy over there who told me to do it, and I don't really want anything to do with him. And it's just this crushing thing where I don't know if Jesus was watching all of that transpire, but it had to have been crushing for Jesus because Jesus is standing there saying, there's even more that I can do for you, but you were wanting to actually throw me under the bus thinking that you're the one who can work this out and so when he comes and says stop sinning stop turning away from me (laughs) what he's saying is do you want to get well and what he's asking this man to do all over again is would you just take your eyes off this pool eyes on me Would you stop listening to this over here? I don't care some of the things really that you've been taught up to this point. Remember Jesus says it a lot in Matthew's Gospel. You've heard that it was said, but I'm telling you. Me. It's this other dramatic moment where Jesus is telling this guy, that pool is closing as well through the work that God is doing through me. It's just Jesus declaring to him, I'm not just some miracle worker. I'm the one who's come to save you. I'm the one that Isaiah said. This should should strike a a chord with this guy. I mean, Jesus is in essence saying, I'm the one Isaiah talked about when he said, you're going to know the Lord when he stands among you because the lame will leap into the air like deer. It's not just do you want to get well, do you want to get saved? And I know you all might sit here and think to yourselves, that's kind of an odd question to ask because most of us are saved, man. A long time ago, I recognized that really all the other world religions and world philosophies, they they offer me pools and I need more than pools. I need someone who says, I'll take care of this. But I've told you before, the thing is, for me in ministry, there's a lot of things that I have to confront in a lot of different people's lives, but this is the one I often have to confront the most. It's the person who sits back and wonders, I don't know where I am with God anymore. And when I kind of nudge them a little bit further, it's the same old thing. I don't pray enough. I don't read enough. I don't fast enough. I'm still doing this, and I can't believe I'm still doing that. I know I haven't been at church maybe once out of the last eight weeks. It's the same list of stuff. It's the same kind of pools I always hear. I know I should be doing this, and so I'm going to start doing that. And so half the time they'll ask me, will you hold me accountable on all of this? And I said, look, all of that stuff is good and important to talk about, but the truth is I think you need to hear the gospel. 
I think you need to hear that the pool is closed. Do you want to get well? People panic about this all the time. And it's the beauty of this man who's standing before Jesus and said, oh, I, I've taken care of that too. And so it really is reunion for you. I don't care how long you've been a believer. There will be moments where you will find yourself in one great old ancient father wrote, you will find yourself in what he called the dark night of the soul and you will wonder, am I anywhere near the father anymore? And it's the same kind of questions that you've got to ask yourself, all right, when I fear I'm not well, when I fear I'm not saved even, is my first inclination to head to some pool? Okay, I'll offer this prayer, I'll do this fast, I'll lift up this confession, or do you just realize, you know what, even those things that are good and can fill me up to a certain degree, they're ultimately empty because I just got to turn again and say, Jesus, you are all that I have. Make me well. When I fear I'm not well, when I fear I'm not saved, will I choose to seek Jesus first? I'm actually telling you, I don't know if this means I'm going to work myself out of a job. But when you panic, I don't want you saying, I need to go talk to Brian. I'd love to talk with you. I think you might need to talk with Jesus a bit. Because you know what? I think he would look at you and say, do you want to get well? I can make you well. Eyes on me. Pools closed. Eyes on me. Ears on me.